Hey everybody, I'm JC Peretz. I'm the founder of allstarcharts.com. I want to give a big shout out to Stock Charts TV for inviting me onto their program. Uh, we're going to do this every week. And basically what I had in mind when they came up to me, they're like, JC, so what should your show be all about? And I was like, well, you know, why don't we talk about something educational, right? Something that I've learned uh, oftentimes the hard way, or, you know, sometimes I've been fortunate to have learned it from one of my predecessors or one of my colleagues, but we could really drill down on a good lesson, right? Um, obviously we're here for the charge. So let's talk about what the market's doing, uh, what, what it's been doing, where we think it's going, not just U.S. stocks, but globally. Uh, we'll include the intermarket relationships that we analyze as well in the commodities markets, interest rates markets, uh, currency markets, of course, all of those intermarket relationships between them. So we're going to talk about those things. And then we're going to take some questions, right? Um, a lot of people have some questions, some things maybe I take for granted. It's like, oh, yeah, I've been doing it that way forever. And I just forgot uh, how important it is. Or maybe it just kind of slipped my mind. So the questions are great, not to mention... Uh, in my experience, when I do things, I learn from the questions. You know, oftentimes you guys will present maybe an ETF that I've never heard of or a family of ETFs that I've never heard of. That actually comes, that happens quite often. I'm like, whoa, this thing is cool. Um, something else that I, I, I've learned in the past is to be able to say, hey, I don't know. I've never heard of that particular indicator or I've never heard of that analyst or fund manager that you're quoting, but I'll go do some homework. And a lot of times I learn that way also. So that's basically my plan, right? Some education, let's talk about the markets, and then we'll take some questions, right? That seems like it makes the most sense to me. All right, so uh, the first thing that I want to do is talk about monthly candles. That's today's lesson. So here we are coming into January of 2021, uh, first trading week of the year. And I got to tell you, of all the things that I do, and you guys that have know, known me for a while, have been following along, know that these monthly candlestick charts are so important. It is the most valuable six hours of work I put in every year. And why six hours, JC? Well, it only takes me about 30 minutes to get through them. You know, usually I run through them a couple of times, but let's just call it 30 minutes. It takes me to run through about 150 monthly candlestick charts that I believe are the most important assets in the world. Obviously, things like the S&P 500 and the Dow, um, but also the German DAX and the Japanese Nikkei. Hong Kong and a lot of the indexes around the world, not to mention the sectors themselves, financials, utilities, technology, healthcare, communications, right? All of the sectors, the sub-industry groups like medical devices, regional banks, so beneath the sector level. And then, of course, some of the most important stocks in the world, Freeport, McMoran, JP Morgan, all these bellwethers that represent a, a certain group of stocks or a certain region of the world, right, geographically. There are a lot of different names that give us a lot of information. Apple, obviously, Microsoft, Berkshire Hathaway, excellent bellwether. You know, things like IBM, General Electric have been great bellwethers in the past. Not so much these days. Exxon Mobil and Chevron, great representation of the energy space, of course. So there are certain names that you kind of almost consider an index. Okay, great. So now we make that list of what I think are the 150 or so most important assets in the world. Stocks, commodities, oil, gold. In, you know, interest rates around the world, all of the things, but, you know, you, you know, you don't need me to tell you. What are we doing? We're looking for the direction of the primary trend. That's why these monthly charts are so important because you only get one data point each month, right? 12 times a year, we get a new data point. So half an hour each month, that gives us six hours. Guys, I promise you, there is no six hours of work I put in through the entire year that even comes close to how valuable it is for me to analyze monthly charts. Not only does it help us sort of zoom out and take a step back, it forces us to. We have no choice but to identify the direction of the primary trend. It actually becomes impossible to ignore it. And if you're trading in the direction of the primary, in the primary trend, the probabilities of success are going to be way higher than if you're constantly fighting those trends. And the monthly candlesticks allow us to do that. Not to mention, it's easy to get caught in the noise, right? What did the Dow do today? What did the market do today? What did the Fed say or do? You know, what was the earnings announcements? It's like, what happened this afternoon? What happened earlier this morning? What happened yesterday? Let's stop once a month, 
take a step back and really analyze what's going on. Sure, you had a bunch of churning throughout the months. Everyone's getting whipped around and boom, we go out at the highs. That was a heck of a month. Maybe it didn't feel that way because you were getting whipped around, but when all said and done at the end, it was a heck of a month or it was a poor month or whatever it is, but we can look. And by the way, one last thing, we don't want to analyze these monthly charts in the middle of the month. That's what we have daily charts for and weekly timeframes. Monthly charts should only be analyzed at the end of the month because if you are analyzing incomplete candlesticks, not only are you just confusing yourself, you're wasting brain energy, nothing good comes of analyzing incomplete candlesticks, whether they're monthly, whether they're daily, you know, looking at a daily candlestick at 10 o'clock in the morning is probably not a great idea. You know, looking at a weekly candlestick on a Monday or Tuesday, again, you're getting incomplete information, you're wasting brain energy. If you're looking at charts on a Tuesday, look at the daily charts. If you're looking at the, you know, charts on a weekend, look at the weekly charts. At the end of the month, look at the monthlies. But I got to tell you, you want to know the secret weapon, you want to know the secret sauce, uh, the cheat code, if you will, monthly candlesticks. That's what it is. That's, that's the secret sauce. That's the cheat code. I don't care if you're a day trader, a swing trader, you're a long-term investor, I don't care who you are. It would behoove you to understand the direction of the primary trend. It's not gonna hurt you, right? And if you're trading, and there's nothing wrong with trading against the trend, right? If you're trading for a mean reversion, that's okay. Especially if you understand that it's a mean reversion trade, therefore manage risk tighter, maybe whatever your strategy is, but understanding that you're fighting a trend versus being a part of a trend is important information on these monthly charts. Let us do that. All right, so that's that's my lesson. That's my big to-do uh, on the first show is talk about just how important those monthly candlestick charts are. And don't, listen, don't let me uh, convince you that I'm like this long-term investor and I only look at long-term charts. Like, that's not the case at all. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to make money this quarter. We're trying to make money in the next couple of weeks, next couple of months. That's how we look at it. But these uh, monthly candlestick charts really help uh, put things into context. So, all right, let's uh, let's take a look at some charts, folks. What I'm doing is I'm coming into the beginning of the year. I'm looking at my monthly charts, and what am I seeing? I'm seeing the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Dow Jones Transportation Average closing at all-time highs, all-time monthly closing highs to finish out 2020. What do we know about all-time highs? We know that they are not a characteristic of a downtrend. You don't have uh, new all-time highs in downtrends. That's not a thing. And people are like, oh, JC, you know, uh, this is a bubble. We've gone too far, too fast. You know, we're due for a correction, right? All these things that they say. I'm looking at the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I'll show you guys right here. I'm looking at the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Dow Jones Transportation Average basically doing nothing for three years, flat since January of 2018, and just broke out over the last couple of months. So to me, this points to the fact that not only are we near the end, are we not near the end of a, of a bull market, I think we're closer to the beginning. We just broke out. And then of course, you know, you got people that are thinking that they're so smart, right? Oh, all my assets are going up, Bitcoin and Ethereum and my tech stocks and all these things that I own are going up. I must be so smart. No, it's not because you're smart, it's because everything's going up. Discretionary is making all-time highs, tech making all-time highs, healthcare, communication, staples, materials, industrials, all making new all-time highs. It's a bull market. What do you want me to tell you? It's a bull market. Things are going from the lower left to the upper right, making higher lows, higher highs. These are uptrends, folks. You can fight them if you want. I'm seeing stocks breaking out of huge bases to new highs, more countries breaking out. Breath expansion, not breath deterioration. These are all classic characteristics of a bull market. And those of you guys following along, some of you are new. They're like, oh my God, this guy is a permable. This guy, I can't listen to this guy, right? I get that. And, you know, go back. We've been incredibly bullish since the spring. You know, we took a couple of shots on the short side in April and we got steamrolled. And you know what? We stopped doing that. Our longs were exceeding expectations. Our shorts were getting steamrolled all at the same time. That's the market giving us information. We took a couple of shots on the short side in April. We failed. We stopped doing that. And I would argue, had we not taken those shots, we wouldn't have been as bullish as we have been over the last eight months. And we have been some of the biggest bulls on Wall Street. Thank God. Boy, did that work out well. 
And along the whole way, people are asking, JC, what's it going to take for you to get bearish equities? What's it going to take for you to get short again like we did in January and early February of last year? What's it going to take? Well, let's talk about what it's going to take. These are the four things I'm looking at. We need to think about what the environment is going to be like if stocks are under pressure, right? What is that environment like? What else is happening, right? So let's let's think. Stocks are selling off, right? Um, we come in, Dow futures down 3%, follows through throughout the afternoon. You know, we keep getting selling. You know, the, the, the cartoon networks with their, you know, market meltdown or marketing crisis or whatever it is that they call it, right? All of those things. What else is happening in that environment? Well, I would argue that treasury bonds are outperforming stocks, right? As we get that safe haven into U.S. treasury bonds, right? I would also argue that consumer staples are outperforming, right? Think about consumer staples, things that we're going to be buying no matter how bad the economy is. We're still going to be drinking beers and brushing our teeth and washing our dishes, right? All of those things, cigarettes, all of those things, not me. I mean, I don't really drink beer. I'm a wine guy. I don't smoke cigarettes, thank God. And my wife loves doing laundry. So I don't do any of those things. I brush my teeth. But as consumers, we're going to be buying consumer staples at a faster rate because of their defensive nature than we are other stocks. So you're going to see staples outperforming. In fact, as you can see here, you can see right in the middle in February, staples spiked relative to the rest of the market. Classic characteristic of an environment where stocks are under pressure. We'll probably see gold outperforming too, right? Probably see gold outperforming, staples outperforming, bonds outperforming. And we'll see Japanese yen outperforming Aussie dollar, right? Why? Why, JC? Why yen Aussie? Well, the, the easy answer is it looks exactly like the other ones, right? <laughs> That's the easy answer. Um, but the reality of the matter is, you know, if you, you know, if you really want to get technical about it, Australian dollar, commodities oriented, inflation, global growth exports to china etc cetera, etc cetera, right that's where you're going to get it aussie japanese yen you're going to get that defensive trade you're going to get that unwind so with yen aussie making new lows staples relative to stocks making new lows bonds making new relative lows gold inching up a little that's like the one and by the way just because gold outperforms doesn't mean stocks are under pressure it's just one of the things that we're looking for that will most likely happen if stocks are under pressure I'd argue the other three are probably more of a lock that if they're ripping, stocks are under pressure. Just because gold's outperforming equities doesn't necessarily mean stocks are under pressure, but I would argue if stocks are selling off, gold's probably going to be outperforming. So we're going to go ahead and add it to the list. Let's take that staples concept one step further and compare it to consumer discretionaries also going out at all time monthly closing highs to finish out 2020. So what does that mean? Consumer discretionaries are the opposite of consumer staples. These are things where we're going to be spending our discretionary income, things like automobiles, home builders, retailers, right? Those are discretionaries versus the staples, cigarettes, beer, laundry, toothpaste, right? We're making all-time highs. That's the long-only mutual fund community positioning themselves long for a rising market environment, overweight discretionaries, underweight staples. This is consistent with a stock market environment that's doing well not a market that's doing poorly. As you can see here, when consumer discretionaries are outperforming staples, S&Ps are going up. When staples are outperforming discretionaries and this black ratio is going down, stock market's probably going down too. So now let's zoom in specifically to consumer staples because guys, you know, we talked about the monthly charts being the cheat code. From a defensive standpoint, when we're looking at the intermarket relationships and the sector rotation underneath the surface to ignore the behavior of consumer stables, I believe is irresponsible. Regardless of time horizon, regardless of risk tolerance, this is part of that cheat code. Consumer stables on a relative basis, if they're outperforming, that's probably happening in an environment that stocks are selling off. Staples making new relative lows, that's happening in an environment that stocks are doing well. So guess what's happening? Stables are making new lows on a relative basis. And what do you know? The S&P 500 is making all-time highs. So is the Dow. So is the NASDAQ. So is small caps, mid caps. We can go on and on and on. So we're at the levels or near the levels, just below the levels where staples started to outperform in 2018. So if they were ever going to outperform, 
this would be a perfectly logical place for it to happen. Now, to be clear, it has not happened, which is consistent with higher stock prices, but it's on the way. And by on the way means like it can continue lower, meaning the S&P 500 continues higher, or we reverse, staples start to outperform, and in that case, stocks are probably under pressure. So if you start getting a rally here, I'd, uh, I'd start to position ourselves more defensively. I would start looking at the bonds, see what they're doing on a relative basis, see what Aussie yen looks like, see what credit spreads are doing, see if they're blowing out. You know, those are the things that we'll then see. Um, and now let's flip that upside down just so you can see here we're putting the S&P 500 as the numerator, staples as the denominator, right? So, as, so it's basically staples relative strength inverted. So both these charts look exactly the same. New highs in the S&P 500, new lows in staples relative, right? And this has been a great heads up in the past. Look back in 2015, higher highs in the S&P, outperformance in staples ahead of that decline. Same thing in 2018, higher highs in S&Ps, consumer staples outperforming. Same thing earlier this year. To be clear, that's not what's happening now. We are getting underperformance from staples, which again is a classic characteristics of strong markets. All right. Now, what else is likely happening in an environment that stocks are selling off? Let's go back to other sell-offs. And, and what's a pretty common denominator among all of the major sell-offs in American history or, or global markets history, not just in the U.S.? What is it? You know what I've noticed? A lot of failed breakouts. You know, the way I learned it from uh, alphatrends.net, my boy Brian Shannon is that, and I learned this a long time ago, thanks Brian, from failed moves come fast moves in the opposite direction. We call them whipsaws. Ed Sakota even wrote a song about it, and it's really catchy, and it's going to stay in your head all day, so be careful looking it up on YouTube because it's going to stay in your head. You've been warned. Uh, so anyway, he wrote a song about it. It's one of the greatest traders ever. He even wrote a song about whipsaws because there's nothing you can do about it. You want to avoid whipsaws? Stop trading. But in all like the, the old technical analysis books, and I've read pretty much all of them, they talk about whipsaws almost like a negative. Like, hey, we want to buy the breakout, but be careful for the whipsaw. Or, hey, we want to short the stock here, but be careful with the whipsaw. It never like, these books never tell us to look for the whipsaws. I think whipsaws are great. You see vicious, vicious moves, and it's a great source of information because when you go back in the past, what do you see? You see a lot of failed breakouts at the beginning of bear markets, at the beginning of vicious sell-offs. So why don't we take a look at two potential failed breakouts. Here's the New York Stock Exchange composite breaking out above those highs from earlier this year, from February, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average doing the same thing breaking out above those highs from February. Now, if we're entering a period of volatility, we're entering a period where stocks are gonna be under pressure, guess what? The New York Stock Exchange composite is probably gonna be below those 2020 highs. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, again, probably below those, tw those February 2020 highs. Expect these to be failed breakouts. I would argue this will be the beginning of a vicious sell-off if these are failed breakouts. And to be clear, they have not failed. They're holding above those February highs. And if the New York Stock Exchange composite, which by the way, over 50 of the largest 100 components of the New York Stock Exchange composite are not even in America, they're foreign, they're foreign companies. So there's a lot of international exposure there, hence it's under performance uh, longer term. But if we're entering a period of severe selling, Expect the New York Stock Exchange Composite and the Dow Jones Industrial Average to be back below their February 2020 highs. But they're not. They're still holding above. And I want to just really look at that because let's go back to October of 2018 when we got incredibly bearish that first week of October. And why were we getting so bearish? Well, there were some intermarket relationships that had us pretty bearish. Uh, but in addition to that, look at these failed breakouts. The Dow Jones Industrial Average failed to hold above the January highs from 2018. And by the way, this comes directly from our monthly conference call. Uh, that's why the kind of the screenshot isn't so great. This comes directly from the monthly conference call from October of 2018. The selling had already started. We were already short. We were already hoping for lower lows. And by the way, this was just the beginning. Uh, stocks ended up selling off for an additional 10 weeks uh, into the end of 2018 before finally rallying. And my point at the time was that 
This was, and again, this also comes from that same conference call that we do for our clients. What, 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 what have we seen when we look back in the past? Look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, right? In 2007, from failed moves come fast moves in the opposite direction. Look at the S&P 500 in 98, nasty failed breakout and collapse. Look at the NASDAQ 100 20 years ago in March of 2000 when the tech bubble peaked. Look at that crash. Look at the Dow Jones Transports in 1969. You know, the markets change, markets evolve. Um, we get new asset classes, all of these things. But you want to know the one thing that remains constant? It's you and me. It's the fear and the greed between the years. That's what's going on. This was also from that conference call. This was the Russell 2000 breaking back below 169, as you can see here. So a lot of failed breakouts, which is classic, a classic characteristics of the beginning of severe bear market. So here we are today. Here we're looking at the New York Stock Exchange Composite and Dow Jones Industrial Average. And I would argue very strongly that if we're above those February 2020 highs and you're trying to short stocks, you're spending all your time looking for stocks to sell versus looking for stocks to buy, Think you're gonna have a hard time because this is an uptrend right and that's what this is all about it's about identifying the direction of the primary trend technical analysis is not like some holy grail it's not like some uh magic indicator what is technical analysis we're analyzing the behavior of markets and therefore market participants to identify the direction of trends changes in trends ongoing trends long-term trends short-term trends that's what we're doing because we know that <laughs> Market returns don't fall under a normal distribution. We know that. Markets trend, right? So if something's going up, there's a much higher likelihood that it's going to keep going up versus just completely reversing out of nowhere. So let's keep that in mind. All right. Why don't we talk about the inflation that's taking place? People are like, well, JC, we're not seeing any inflation. We're not seeing any inflation at all, JC. Well... Here's the CRB index, is the commodities index breaking back above those 2016 lows. You want inflation? You're wondering why bonds can't get a bid and interest rates keep going up? Here's your CRB index back above those former lows. Here's crude oil, classic head and shoulders top, classic topping pattern in crude oil. We broke the neckline, we completely collapsed. We rallied back, struggled as should have been expected. And what happened in, in the fourth quarter? We are now back above that neckline. So in a very similar way that the CRB index is above the 2016 lows, crude oil above 40, man, you want to be short in commodities? You want to be uh, bearish inflation if there's such a thing? Uh, or you want to be uh, uh, not acknowledging these inflationary forces? Be my guest. And by the way, I don't think that this is bad for stocks. I think this is good for stocks. A lot of market capitalization in some of these energy names, a lot of international exposure in energy, a lot of these emerging markets have exposure to natural resources. I just don't see this as a negative for equities. I would argue this is another positive for stocks. Let me get me out of here. So emerging markets, natural resources, et cetera, et cetera. What does that mean? Here's China A shares breaking out to new highs new five-year highs for china here's chinese internet making new all-time highs here's chinese technology making new all-time highs let me point you to january of 2018 that's when risk peaked all over the world we went nowhere for almost three years and are just now breaking out chinese tech chinese internet china shanghai to quote the great philosopher yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again folks downtrend base breakout ripper downtrend base breakout ripper downtrend base breakout i'm thinking rippers next and all of these charts up here tend to agree that ripper is next and by the way going back to that october 2018 conference call this was Chan Sh shanghai composite breaking down to new lows again not breaking out to new highs not Chinese internet and Chinese uh, tech breaking out to new all-time highs. When we were bearish in October of 2018, China was breaking down to new lows. So to be clear, this is not that environment, right? This is not that environment. China's breaking out. Here's the global Dow. Um, very 
my favorite global representation, really. I like the weightings. Go check out the weightings. Maybe India's a little light. Um, but for the most part, I like the weightings. Just broke out again of a three-year base. Here you go. There's your October, uh, excuse me, your uh, January 2018 peak. Three years of nothing. Boom, just got the breakout last month. Global 100 index. Boom, just got the breakout last month. If you're a gloom and doomer and you think stocks are selling off, expect to see the Global 100 index below 58. German DAX is breaking out to new all-time highs, folks. This is Germany. Germany did nothing for five years. Zero. Zero movement for five years in Germany. Just now breaking out to new all-time monthly closing highs. Now, let's go back to October of 2018. What was going on? Well, in October of 2018, we were getting new highs in the S&P, the Dow, the NASDAQ. Germany was already rolling over. Germany was already making new lows. In fact, Germany was completing a major top. This is what was going on in October when we were so bearish. To be clear, that's not what's happening today. We are breaking out to new all-time highs, not breaking down like we were in October of 2018. We're breaking out to new highs, folks. So the way I see it, I think it's really hard to be bearish um, when you see all of these things taking place. That's how I see it. All right, so why don't we, uh, why don't we answer a few questions. See. see what kind of questions we got all right so first question we got a couple of minutes first question jc i had a great 2020 in the market congrats phil i feel like we're due for a correction how can this market possibly continue higher listen i get this question a lot so no offense but you know, you're looking for a correction. The Dow and the Dow Jones Industrial Average and Dow Transports did nothing for three years and are just now breaking out. You wanted a correction, what do you call that? Europe's flat for 20 years, hasn't done anything for 20 years. The Euro stock 600. You're waiting for a correction? We haven't even broken out yet. Emerging markets are still below their 2008 highs. You're looking for a correction? EM hasn't even broken out. You can argue financials are the most important sector in America, maybe even the world. The XLF, the financials index, is still below the 2007 highs. You're waiting for a correction? You're waiting for a pullback? We haven't even broken out yet. I think that if you're looking for a correction, even short term, look at tech, communications, consumer discretionaries. They've done nothing since early September. Nothing. You're waiting for a correction? What do you call that? That's how I see it. Uh, JC, the year started out a little shaky. Isn't that bad for the Santa Claus rally? Well, remember, the Santa Claus rally is the last five trading days of the year, the first two of the following year. So it started on the 24th of December, ended on January the 5th. Uh, so we were positive. Santa Claus did show up. There was no divergence. Uh, so there's not really anything to talk about. Uh, Santa showed up, no big deal. And um, we could just move on with our lives. It's not like, oh my God, like this ominous sign. It's just, all right, no big deal. Markets rallied when they were supposed to. We can now move on. And um, the last question, JC, what is your favorite technical indicator? Uh, not to be obnoxious, uh, but my favorite technical indicator is price. That's it. You know, you've got price, and then a far second is everything else. Momentum, relative strength, volume, whatever indicator you built in your mom's basement or whatever. I'm just kidding. But you know what I mean? Like, whatever indicator you put together, all of those things are a far, far second to price. Price, price is king. Price is the only thing that pays. So for all of you guys, if you're interested in... Um, let's see, here we go. If you are interested in the slides, uh, email askjc at allstarcharge.com if you want the slides or if you have any questions. Uh, obviously, if you want the slides, make sure you tell them that you want the slides. If you have any questions, ask the question and we will try to uh, answer that here on the show. So guys, just want to give a, a huge shout out um, to uh, stockcharts.com, Stockcharts TV for inviting me uh, onto the program. Uh, my name is JC Peretz of allstarcharts.com. Thank you for being here. Make sure to email askjc at allstarcharts.com if you're interested in the slides or if you want to submit a question. Thanks, folks. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.